isometric fantasy scenes, great big swords, simulated dice rolls. Did it work? Did our time machine finally work and send us back to the early 2000s like we've always dreamed? Not quite. Pillars of Eternity 2 Deadfire is the next best thing though, a big swashbuckling RPG from legendary studio Obsidian that recaptures the golden age when Baldur's Gate, Planescape Torment and Icewind Dale were on the shelves. Yes, games were placed on shelves in the olden days. And just like that arcane practice of selling physical discs, it's easy to forget how difficult games used to be 20 years ago. And with so many systems going on at once besides the punishing combat, it pays to go into Pillars 2 with a little bit of a heads up. Consider this video that very thing. Seven tips that'll take the sting out of its old school difficulty. In many modern role-playing games, you can rush into the fray with any old tagalongs, but here you need a well-balanced squad to survive. What does well-balanced mean? Well, as a rule of thumb, it's always a good idea to include a couple of pain sponges, although we hear they prefer to be called tanks if it's all the same to you. Fighters and paladins make good tanks with their high constitution and strength stats, which means they can take the lead in a fight and soak up the brunt of the damage while those flimsy spellcasters dust off their tomes in relative safety behind them. So tanks, check. But what else? A couple of ranged damage dealers is a good idea. You can go down the magical route with a wizard, or the pistols and animals route with the ranger. Or both if you want to see what a fight between a coral naga, five magical hard nuts, and a weaponized parrot looks like. That leaves a fifth slot open for a healer or utility build whose primary purpose is weakening enemies with debuff spells, healing friendlies, and keeping the odds tipped in your favor. Once you've got your party sorted out, you need to think about formation. Make sure your defensive characters are at the front and your casters are at the back. And ideally, your frontline troops should be decked out in medium or heavy armor. And keep your faster characters in light armor. There's no point slowing down a monk or a priest with heavier gear. It's also smart to give party members alternate weapons that deal out different types of damage. So if your first set deals out slash damage, try a weapon with the crush pierce stat in the second slot. And remember that guns and crossbows are great first shot weapons for spellcasters because they won't go into recovery immediately after firing. Yes, we're actually telling you to press the spacebar, like that's a pro tip. But whenever an RPG recommends pausing mid-fight to issue orders, there's always a temptation to take it with a pinch of salt and try and hack your way through in real time. I mean, how hard could it be? It turns out really, really infuriatingly hard. Making use of the pause function will lessen that difficulty by orders of magnitude. Use it to tell party members when to heal, when to change position, and even when to use their abilities. And there's no shame in it. Look, the game even auto-pauses by default. You can manage the auto-pause options in the menu, and if you're still struggling, try moving the combat speed slider, located here, all the way to the left to make fights play out at the slowest speed possible. Conversely, you can press F to speed things up, which is especially handy if you're waiting for stealthy characters to creep about. Time is your plaything. Now that we've approached the complexity of combat, let's backpedal right out again before we get lost in those stats menus forever. Here's a quick and invaluable tip. Press Tab at any time to highlight all the items and NPCs in the area. Pretty cool, eh? Not convinced? All right then, consider this instead. Many of the finest loot items in the game are stowed away in absolutely tiny hiding places that you'll never find just by hovering the mouse over the dark dungeon corners. And if you're still not convinced, how about this? Pressing tab also shows you the names of NPCs on screen you can interact with. If you're hungry for quests, this is a good way of identifying important NPCs. And if you're returning to a quest giver with the spoils of war but completely forgot where you met them, tab is your new best friend. Here are a few of a sailor's favourite things. Grog, coin, winning a battle on the high seas and plundering the enemy ship, and also grog. Now experienced captains will already have noted that nowhere on that list does it say sailing after an uneventful day on a diet of hard tack and water. Sailors absolutely hate this. They hate it so much, in fact, that even though you're their captain, even though you're the one and only watcher of Cad Nua, they might consider mutiny. But it's easy to avoid this fate. Just buy tastier foods from merchants when you're on dry land and then place them in the left-hand food slot in your ship management screen. Mariner's porridge all round, which apparently contains a fried egg. You go for it, lads. I think I've still got some hardtack on my bedside table. 
combat is a ruthlessly difficult affair in Pillars of Eternity 2. Don't believe us? Just watch this. See? And while there's a lot to be said for digging deep into its mechanics and learning to micromanage every party member during every fight, making use of every ability and every potion, well, we've already talked ourselves out of it, and that's probably another video all by itself. Instead, let's just hit that party AI button and let them do all the hard work. Located in the bottom left, just above your party's character portraits, this little icon determines whether your companions will run a set of scripts based on their level and abilities, or wait for you to tell them when to use their skills. It makes the game much easier, and even if you strive one day to beat the game on harder difficulty levels, it's still worth enabling party AI just to get a feel for how different classes and builds actually work. In this and every RPG, leveling up is a bit like being let loose in a great big sweet shop of colourful new things. Look at the numbers going up. Ooh, those new abilities look good enough to eat. Let's just gorge ourselves on the new things, eh? Except that if you do that in Pillars of Eternity 2, you'll end up with a character who's basically totally useless. It's important to decide what kind of build you're creating right from the very first level and follow it through as you gain experience. Otherwise, your abilities and stats won't correspond to each other and you'll be weak like a duckling when the fighting actually starts. Building a paladin, focus on strength and hit points with some healing on the side. Want a cool monk bringing the pain all holy-like? Make sure to upgrade their abilities when they become available instead of picking new ones at every level up screen. Elsewhere, think about investing in alchemy to extend the duration of the drugs you use. They're a really powerful tool worth exploiting. And it's always worth giving every character a few points in athletics to help pass party skill checks. Finally, don't forget the passive abilities in your class trees. Active abilities are obviously snazzier, but the passive stuff can be hugely effective as well. New to the Pillars series, manning a ship has a few wrinkles that don't reveal themselves until you've clocked up a few hours behind the, the big wheel thing that steers the ship. You know the one. It's called a wheel, isn't it? Anyway, one of them is naval combat, which is expressed as a sort of text adventure until it comes time to boarding another vessel or having some scallywag board yours. In that scenario, the real-time engine kicks back in to let you fight it out. So how do you avoid the embarrassment of being plundered on the open ocean? The very basic version is that it's a matter of comparing your numbers to theirs. If you have more guns and more crewmen, you'll probably win the battle. If they outnumber you, it'll be very difficult to pull off a David versus Goliath victory. It's more complex than that, obviously, but if you're just starting out, that is the first thing you need to know. If you're going slightly deeper, you need to look at things like your ship's facing and distance and compare them with the range of your cannon. Firing outside their optimal range will have an effect on their accuracy. You should also keep some crew in reserve in case anyone critical gets injured. And remember that the cook and navigator can get involved if you need extra hands. And finally, if your crew does get injured, make sure you move them into the reserve so the surgeon can heal them. We're off to tinker with that time machine again now, so it's over to you to leave your own tips below, hit the thumbs up button to show your appreciation, and subscribe to us if you don't want to walk the plank and lose your soul down in the depths of Davy Jones's locker. Just kidding, but only about the plank.